Hello and welcome to Preprints in Motion. Join us as we sit down with early career researchers and discuss their latest preprint and find out about their journey through the muddy marshes of academia. But we don't stop there. Every month we'll be bringing you special episodes with open science leaders where we discuss how to fix academia. Easy, right? So hit that subscribe button, leave a rating, or find us on Twitter at MotionPod. But for now, let's get into the show. This week we discuss how journalists approach reporting preprints with the amazing Alice Fleerackers. Um, okay, <laughs> so, so we have crossed paths a few times before, and I do really like your work, which is part of the reason you're on. Part of the reason you're on here today <laughs> is because this is just really good work. Um, but also, the title of the preprint meant we kind of had to have you on. I, I mean, science in motion, preprints, I mean, we couldn't, we couldn't not have you on. <laughs> and we would normally start with the fun fact that we get given. But I think with you, we might start with something else, because you said something in the little form, we get all the guests to fill out, that I really liked, and I try and do a lot of too. You really wanted to highlight the mention of your co-authors when we talk about all this work, which is so nice to do. So many people just don't do that. It's all me, me, me. And you're all them, 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 which is just great. That, that I think that is a good way to start because I think that really shows you as a researcher and how you approach things. And I think that's the best way to approach things. Yeah, I mean, sure. Is this my time to talk now? You can talk whenever you want. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I mean, yeah, like it's it's interesting because the first paper we put out um, back in January 2021, I guess it was. I'm losing track of pandemic time, but you know, we got so much media coverage and so much of it had my name on it, which I'm obviously grateful for, especially as a, a young scholar. But that was a majorly collaborative project. And actually all of the work that I do and, and really enjoy doing has been collaborative. So it's a, it's a shame that there's not often space in media coverage to highlight co-authors, but perhaps in a podcast, you've got a little bit more leeway. So yeah, I'm really, really grateful for the amazing lab that I kind of live in currently, uh, both uh, metaphorically and sometimes physically. And my co-authors on on this paper who have been amazing. This one was with Laura Moorhead uh, in San Francisco, uh, with Lauren Maggio, who is in DC, Kaylee Fagan. I hope I'm saying her name right. This is the weird thing when you're operating over, <laughs> over Slack, but Kaylee Fagan, uh, who just joined, uh, I believe, the journalist resource. And with my supervisor here at SFU, Juan Pablo Alperin. Um, and it's a really interesting team because everybody comes from very different backgrounds. So like and several of us have a bit of a background in journalism or science writing. Then we have sort of some information science and, and sort of more scholarly communications expertise and then a medical librarian. So together we have this really different, these really different perspectives. And I think that that's really shaped all of the research that we've done and, and particularly this paper. And those are the best teams because everyone brings something new. Yeah. So let's get into the pre we're talking about. Could you give us a quick overview of what it is you did and what it was you found? Right. So we've been really interested in this question of, of journalists and how they've been using preprints, mostly during the pandemic, but also just more broadly. And a lot of that was inspired by that paper that you were involved in about how preprints became so dominant in the pandemic discourse and that they got so much more media coverage than the non-COVID preprints. And that all of this sort of sparked this curiosity about preprints in journalism. And, you know, the, the previous work we did, we actually looked at, you know, how preprints were being used in news stories, looking at the actual sort of content that the public is seeing. But after we put that out and in lots of conversations with journalists, I kind of realized that that's only half of the story. The thing that makes it out into the public is only half of the actual journalism taking place. And so we wanted to go a little bit behind the scenes and actually see, you know, what's the decision making process of the journalists who are deciding to cover preprints or even deciding not to cover preprints? How has COVID sort of changed that decision making and what practices are journalists using sort of behind the scenes to verify and kind of evaluate preprints? to decide whether or not to cover them, to kind of frame them or contextualize them in a way for their audiences. How are they actually getting a hold of preprints? All of these things that sort of don't make it into the news story themselves, we were, we were really curious to find out about. Oh yeah, so what did we do to find out what journalists are doing? We decided to speak to journalists themselves. So we did some qualitative analysis of interviews we conducted with 19 journalists who reported on research for eight 
publications. I mean, many of them were freelancers, so they've actually written for tons of other publications. But we spoke with these journalists um, during sort of semi-structured interviews. So where you really sort of similar to a podcast, actually, you're just asking people about, you know, how they work and, and how they view research. Um, and then we went through those transcripts and we looked for all the bits that were about preprints and and tried to pull out themes that related to our research questions and see if there's sort of overarching patterns in the data. And that's where our results came from. Did that answer your question? I've already forgotten what your question was. One of the things I really liked about this is that a lot of the answers, a lot of things you found were things that journalists have said to me when we've been chatting. So I mean, you know, the, the COVID work that we did, we were fortunate enough to get a bit of media attention and I was weirdly in a position where I was talking to a lot of journalists, which is not its not what you really expect to do as a scientist, to be honest. And it was really interesting from my end because obviously a lot of it, the conversation was solely focused on COVID and the pandemic. And our findings had suggested that things were being covered more. So preprints were suddenly being covered in you know, government stuff as well as journalists, by journalists. We never looked at why they were doing that or how they were going about that. But I was getting a lot of the stuff that you've now found on that other side of it. So when a journalist is approaching a preprint to cover, how, what, what is it in their decision-making process that makes them decide to cover a preprint? Because that is, from what I could gather, that is different to covering a published paper. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a few sort of things that are relevant to that question. And one was really this consideration of audience. So the journalists we spoke with were very aware of who was reading their work. And we're really thinking about sort of what would be meaningful or important and helpful to their audience but also what would their audience understand um, and what did their audience expect? So these sort of audience, this audience awareness came through in a lot of our results, um, but it's very relevant to this question of what are they thinking about when they're deciding to cover a preprint. And the way it was sort of framed by several of the journalists we spoke with was sort of this careful risk benefit analysis, like a, a balancing of the public's potential, potentially really helpful outcomes of covering new preprint research. And this was often about coronavirus, um, the examples they gave like, oh, this could actually help people stay safer during the pandemic. And they would balance sort of these potential benefits with the risk that potentially that preprint could change in important ways during the peer review process or might never be peer reviewed at all, which I think many journalists saw as potentially ending up becoming a source of misinformation. So there was this, yeah, this really careful thinking and this this sort of really sort of thoughtfulness about what this would mean for their audience, which um, I think is very important to note. And then in terms of what actually motivated them to, to yes, let's cover it, they were often actually things that we talk about as scientists as beneficial as well, like the fact that they were accessible and freely available. Um, was something that several journalists uh, mentioned. And then, of course, timeliness. Like peer review takes a long time and preprints are almost instant to post. And so many journalists really valued this specifically in the context of COVID-19, but also more broadly. And that's actually where that quote about science in motion came from. One journalist literally said, you know, preprints feel like science in motion and creation. You know, they are where you're seeing the conversations of science itself taking place in real time. And that is just so much more exciting as a journalist to cover than things that have kind of gone stale because they've been sitting in peer review for six months. So that to me was just such a lovely uh, quote and we decided that that should be our, our title of our preprint. So one of the things that I think I said, we we had an episode last, well, it was came out last week with uh, John Ingalls and Richard Sever. I think I said it in, this, in that episode, but I'll say it again because it's more relevant here. One of the journalists that I spoke to, he said the thing he really likes about preprints uh, particularly bioarchive in this case, but preprints generally, is that they were really easy to find. If you want to find something, you just had to click on the right category in bioarchive and it was there. Whereas obviously with journals, you've kind of got to find the journal and work your way through their mess. So did you get any insight into how journalists were finding the preprints that they were actually using in their articles? Definitely. So yeah, it was really interesting because, it, okay, first of all, the journalists we spoke with were very diverse in terms of where they were writing for, how sort of specialized they were, um, how technical their outlet was. So some of the outlets that these folks were writing for were like targeted, I think, to doctors and researchers. And some of them were very general interests, like a New York Times. I mean, it was from the science section, but still, you know, these are very different audiences and the journalists were very different. So there was a wide range of answers to many of the 
sort of questions we were asking. But with regards to finding, we found there was sort of this mix. Some journalists or many journalists were actually actively going out to find these preprints, like going directly to BioArchive, to Archive, to MedArchive and looking for them. But then a lot of them were also mentioning sort of more passive methods, like getting a press release. The Science Media Center came up a lot, which is quite funny because they were originally so anti preprint media coverage back in 2018. But it seems like journalists have been finding it very helpful that they are putting out sort of this context along with preprints. And that was that was something that came through as as one way that they found them. What I think is interesting is that the journalists seem to be a bit more skeptical often of this sort of science PR. So getting the press releases sent to them, especially if it was a preprint, there was this thing of what are you trying to promote here, which was really interesting. So there's this, I think for scientists, it's this question of like, should you be promoting your preprint? Or should you just be letting journalists go find it? And is there a way you could write a press release that doesn't make you seem like you're sleazy <laughs> and up to no good? <laughs> I've written a few of those. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually, that, that brings up an interesting point. Have you, I don't think it was in the preprint, but have you spoken to press officers or people from the Science Media Centre about their side of things and why they choose to press release certain preprints? Because I think it's not something we looked at, but I think, I, I mean, anecdotally, there has been an increase in press releases for preprints. That's definitely gone up. There's some quite notable examples of where that's been misused. Obviously, during the pandemic, we've seen science by press release, which mm-hmm. has largely been the clinical trials. But did you speak to anyone on that side to see where their decision making was on that? Yes, yeah, so we didn't. We didn't speak. Uh, with any press officers for this research. I will say I've been in a couple webinars with uh, folks from the Science Media Center and also with other press officers who were talking about their, you know, experiences with preprints. And it's pretty interesting. I feel like the Science Media Center, and and there's an editorial out about this from uh, from Fiona Fox that she she put out with sort of the explanation of their shift in policy. And I I think it kind of aligns with one of the things that some of the journalists in our study said of of like preprints are a reality right now. And during the pandemic, especially like people are going to cover them. So you might as well do your best to make sure that that coverage is nuanced, has context, that there are experts available to comment on it because it's going to happen either way. So we might as well make sure it is as accurate and as helpful as possible. But yeah, we would love to speak more with press officers because they did come through a lot in our data and in other studies we've done with journalists. And we just know they're so important, but they're also sort of that hidden, invisible middleman. Um, And with respect to preprints, if you just look around at the policies at different universities, it seems to vary widely right now. Like it's such an open question and different places have such different feelings about it. So yeah, we had, so the two we had press releases for, they both came from the journal actually. So it was PLOS Biology's decision to do a press release. It wasn't, it wasn't our decision. Um, And that was at the time of publication, not when they were released as preprints. Although interestingly, some of the early reporting was when it was still a preprint and they'd found that through sort of Twitter basically. There's something else we did, didn't make it in our papers, but might be interesting here, is we did speak to a few people on um, the policy side of things. So as mm. a, in the, the UK government, there's a thing called POST, which I can't remember what it stands for. Um, but it's basically like a sort of science unit and they'll write science briefs and reports that go to the government and ministers and, and help them make decisions. And so we spoke to somebody there who said that they'd actually been using preprints for quite a while, but just not it wasn't something that really made it into the reports. Whereas when the pandemic hit, suddenly it was making it into the reports. Obviously, I mean, fairly obvious reasons. But I wonder if a lot of journalists were also doing that and just, you know, not not actually reporting on them, but using them to bolster or support the stuff they were reporting on. Well, you know, the thing that's interesting, we don't really know anything about what journalists were doing before the pandemic with respect to preprints. And it's something I'm very curious about um, and constantly looking through literature to figure out what's been going on. But, you know, we did have a few journalists, at least, who said, you know, COVID didn't change anything. I've been using preprints for forever. And I think if I'm correct, a couple of those folks were people who covered sort of like space topics or Mm. things that you would find on archive, which, as you know, has been, you know, preprinting has just been so normalized in those communities for so long. And it's interesting, there was almost like a parallel normalization with those journalists. Also, some of the journalists who are really working in like very science focused outlets who maybe had a very more science savvy or science interested audience seem to just, yeah, be much more accustomed to reporting on preprints and really talked about it like something they've been doing for years, which, yeah, which was sort of interesting and surprising. 
But then there were other journalists who did not even know what a preprint was when the pandemic happened. There were some journalists who also said a couple of things where I was still unclear that they fully understood what a preprint was. <laughs> and we saw we saw that also in some of the more like content analysis work we did earlier, where we were looking at news stories. We saw things like bioarchive being referred to as a journal in several stories or sort of these definitions of preprint in news stories that were just completely incorrect. Mm -hmm. So there's very, very wide variation in terms of how how often journalists have been using these, how long they've been using them, and how well they understand what actually a preprint is. I would argue a lot of scientists don't really understand. Similar, what yes. <laughs> they do a bit of an education. So that this does lead me quite nicely to my next question, which is when you look at those journalists, does the previous experience of those journalists impact how they responded and how they use preprints? So you've already said, suggested that, you know, those more familiar with the, the physics and the, so that side of things where preprints are normal might be more keen to use them. But, you know, some of the journalists you interviewed had, you know, PhD backgrounds, for example. So mm-hmm. how did that impact their use and how they approach preprints? Yes, yeah, so it was interesting. Our The journalists in our sample were from very different backgrounds. Most of them had some sort of education you know, higher education, either in arts, sort of social science field, a STEM field, and or a journalism field. So most of them had a mix of things. I'd say if if there was like a median kind of education, it was to have a master's degree in something. But what was really interesting to me was the people who had advanced STEM degrees did not necessarily feel better equipped to cover preprints. And we have this one comment from a person who had a, like an, a PhD in a science, uh, technology, engineering, and math field, who really said, you know, I still don't know how to, you know, verify preprints even in my own field. Because as we know, you know, science is so niche. And even within a field or a discipline, there's all these super specialized areas of expertise. So even these people who, you know, on paper seem like they have, they're the best set up to be dealing with new science um, that hasn't been peer reviewed, still found this challenging. Like, what do you do with a paper that hasn't been sort of vetted by other experts and they did not feel equipped? to to do that vetting themselves in many cases. So how did the journalists generally vet articles? It suggested from your work that it was different between preprint or paper. Yeah, so what was really interesting in the answers from journalism, from the journalists we spoke with, was that there were almost these two competing but coexisting ideas about how they were covering preprints. And on the one hand, we had this sort of theme emerge in what they were saying of like, it's just good science journalism, you know, read up on other studies in the field and triangulate your evidence to make sure this aligns with with what we know already, you know, add context, highlight limitations, speak to outside experts. But then on the other hand, there was this sort of emphasis of, okay, but preprints, there's one less safety net. So we need to be extra skeptical. And often what that looked like was, you know, using outside experts, but not just to add some context or some commentary or to sort of legitimize the research, but really to do a form of peer review. And the journalists even said, we're just going to do some quick peer review here because we need to. And so that to me was so interesting. Like it wasn't just one journalist, it was multiple journalists used the term peer review to describe what they were doing. And that to me, at least, and to the other journalists on our team really felt like a departure from the way that experts are normally used. Like they were really being relied on, yeah, in in a similar way that reviewers are relied on in academic research of, should this be published or should this be covered? And if so, like, how do we need to frame it to make sure that we're not overselling results or that we're highlighting limitations? So, yeah, the role of experts, I think, and outside experts was really, really important. That said, you know, journalists are working on crazy deadlines. Sometimes they don't have the resources or the time or they can't get a hold of somebody. And, you know, many actually said they also go on gut feeling or instinct. And that was really interesting as well. So even though they were aware of all these things they should be doing, you know, there's the realities of your job. There are situations where you just make a judgment call and the journalists were sort of skeptical. Many of them said, I see other journalists doing this, you know, but of course I'm always uh, doing all of my great vetting. But, you know, it's, it's hard to be a journalist 
and many of them don't feel prepared. And so the role of sort of instinct or yeah, gut reflex was another sort of strategy that they used to to cover this research. I should say for people who haven't interacted with journalists, when they do cover science, they, they will often reach out to quite a lot of people and just never mention that in the article. So just because a journalist hasn't cited somebody doesn't mean they haven't reached out to a lot of people. Um, I've had a few where I've not been citing the article, but I provided opinion. Yeah, exactly. Which is just good, good journalism. So, see, this is interesting because you're touching on a topic that I'm very opinionated on, which is peer review and how it does or does not quality control articles, which got me a bit of backlash recently. So did you see any evidence that the journalists who were using this sort of informal peer review for preprints doing that then in their other work with published work? Did that ever carry over at all? So the way that it was phrased was, again, with this extra level of skepticism. So uh, they would say things like, you know, reach out to other experts, get their opinion, you know, this is important for all science, but especially for preprints, because they haven't been peer reviewed. And what was interesting is that many of the journalists were actually quite critical of peer review and aware of some of these debates within Mm. academia and some of the research around, you know, the the lack of evidence, uh, or lack of strong evidence, conclusive evidence, whatever you want to say about how effective is peer review at actually doing that quality control thing. So many journalists were very aware of this, but still felt like they had to do this additional step. I mean, that just sounds like a lot of scientists, to be honest. They seem A lot of people seem to be very aware of the issues, but we'll just accept it. Yeah, I mean, I understand it. I guess on some level, you know, I do read preprints a little bit differently than I read a peer-reviewed publication. And it's not necessarily a best practice but I think that for some of the journalists, at least, there was this sense of you can kind of take a, like if you're under a time crunch and you have the decision between a peer reviewed manuscript and a preprint and you don't have time to interview the experts, like cover the peer reviewed manuscript, yeah. which makes sense to me. Like, at least in theory, some of those experts critiques will have informed that peer reviewed yeah. manuscript. So it's not ideal But I do think that if a journalist is under a time crunch and they can't do their due diligence, it's probably still a better idea to go with a peer-reviewed version or a peer-reviewed publication, even if it's just because it's maybe been around a little longer. Like you've seen this in your other research as well, right? Like COVID preprints in particular were sort of more uncertain or like they're more likely to change in, in drastic ways. They're shorter. They're kind of rougher. Um, or at least hypothetic, who are assuming they're rougher based on these other sort of proxies you've used to study them. You know, if you're looking at really, like, if you're looking at a preprint from 10 years ago, that's probably fine because, you know, nobody has withdrawn it. There's pro- there's no huge uh, debate going on on Twitter or on when any of these overlay journals are in the comments sections. But if you're, if it's a totally new piece of evidence, probably this is true of peer-reviewed publications too, but, you know, the newer it is and the less sort of consensus there is around it, the less, you know, that the academic community has had a chance to talk about it, sort of the less comfortable you might feel covering that, mm-hmm. which is related to some, some journalists actually said they were out on Twitter, like looking to see what, what academics were saying. So it's so not exactly peer review, but I think this thing of understanding what the scientific community thinks about a piece of research was quite important to the journalists and mm-hmm. peer review is a proxy for that. Um, more than anything. That feeds, again, nicely into my next question. So Twitter is one of those things that I, if I'm approaching something that I don't know much about, Twitter seems to be a pretty good resource because you can tend to identify, well, assuming it gets enough attention on Twitter, you can identify sort of who is reliable and you can listen to. And there's quite a lot of big COVID papers being retracted or, you know, the problems being highlighted through Twitter. Mm. Some of the other things that preprint servers do is they'll report comments or they'll, by archive in particular, will link out to any community peer review that's been done other than Twitter, any use of those kind of things come through? Yeah, so it was pretty minimal. I think the Twitter was a couple, like two or three journalists mentioned looking at Twitter. And then one person looked, said that they often referenced, I think, pre-review, if I remember correctly. But more than just looking for, you know, feedback from other researchers, it was more to see what is being talked about in general, what's new and exciting. So sort of related to that comment I was talking about earlier of the person who said, I like to know what academics care about right now, that I think that that service was seen as helpful in that respect. But overall, I think, yeah, there was some enthusiasm among many of the journalists for these different sort of evolving forms of open scholarly communication happening um, 
And there's some of them saw this as very exciting because there's more options to go see what's going on and to be closer to the process of science in real time. We need a button for every time you mention Twitter that we can just beep it out because we they get <laughs> yeah. so much free attention on this podcast. I know. So, so one of the things that came up to me when I was reading through this is that a lot of the journalists you spoke to tend to report for the more sort of left wing outlets or the more outlets that are accepting of science which is not left-wing it's just should be normal would you expect different responses if you had people who were reporting for other outlets so i mean i don't want to name any but there's a few i can think of where the scientific reporting is not so scientific well i mean if you're looking at a fake news outlet i don't even know if they're going to be mentioning it like any research if or maybe if they are they're going to be cherry picking Mm. like I don't know, maybe it's from a predatory publisher. Maybe it is one of those pieces that was peer reviewed and should and got retracted, but you're still saying, I don't know if you're talking about misinformation or maybe this is a better question to ask, you know, you can always go find a study that supports your view. This is true, whether it's peer reviewed or preprint. And so if you're actually looking at an outlet that is specifically trying to push its own agenda, that's what I would expect to see is a lot of coverage. Doesn't matter if it's peer reviewed or preprint, but just finding things that support your claims. We didn't talk to journalists about their political identities. We didn't really look at anything political and politics just didn't come into any of these conversations. So I don't really feel I can comment um, much more beyond that. I mean, I guess a lot of the people you spoke to were freelance. I guess they kind of, they probably have higher or different standards to someone who works for a particular named publication, whatever publication that is, because they're always going to have slightly, I would expect to have maybe a bit more of a bias in reporting anyway regardless of what they report on. Because with freelance, you tend, I guess you're bouncing around places more. I think what we can say about freelancers versus in-house folks is that the freelancers always have to sell what they're trying to cover. And so maybe some of these benefits we've talked about, like, you know, the getting the timeliness, the early finding a nugget. I think there was one journalist who said it gives you an edge to cover a preprint because other people have maybe not seen it. That benefit I would assume at least is much higher for a freelancer who has to sell every piece that they're writing about ever. And then the other thing is, you know, different outlets uh, have different kinds of guidelines and best like and things that they expect of their journalists. And so actually a few of the journalists mentioned that there was sort of an in-house guideline around preprints and how to cover them, when to cover them. And what's interesting is we couldn't find any of these online. So I don't know if they're all hidden um, and kind of, you know, not shared publicly, but a freelancer will have to adapt to whatever the norm is of the different outlets they're writing for. And they'll maybe be used to writing for many different kinds of um, audiences as well. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but yeah, they're, they're, it's a very different reality to be a freelancer and you have even more precarity in your job security than um, the already precarious precarious reality of being a science journalist. Yeah. So did you come across any examples where people had reported on something or were about to report on something that was retracted or where there was a lot of controversy? So journalists gave us, well, journalists were very worried about misinformation. Mm -hmm. This was the sort of one of the strongest themes that came through when we talk about risks of preprints and that decision of should you cover them, should you not? And some of the examples people gave were like um, around, there was one preprint, I think, I think it was a preprint about, you you know, running and expelling coronavirus. And that got a bunch of media coverage and and sort of turned out not to totally hold up. There was another example was around, at least one journalist really said they're aware that even if they do their due diligence and try to contextualize the preprint as much as possible, you know, say like all the limitations, say this hasn't been peer reviewed, say this is early science, it's the COVID, it could change as all of the COVID science has been changing. They just know there's gonna be a tiny nugget in their article, maybe it's four words. And those highly, if it's about vaccines, for example, those highly anti-vaccine groups are gonna grab those four words and share them on social media. So journalists were very aware that even if they do the best job possible, once information is out there, it can be twisted, misused, cherry-picked, all these things we talk about in scientific publishing as well, um, and amplified on social media by readers who maybe don't have the same sort of care for their audience in mind 
as the journalists did. And we should, again, point out that uh, the pandemic has probably been a very, very challenging thing to report on, I imagine. It's mm-hmm. been challenging just from a scientific perspective. Yeah. And journalists have generally done an amazing job at, at reporting on it and doing a really good mm-hmm. job of combating and challenging a lot of that misinformation and limiting the misinformation, which mm-hmm. leads me to my next question, which is how can we as scientists help that process? Because obviously there's a lot of examples where scientists have just outright promoted misinformation um, to mm-hmm. sort of further their own careers. But, you know, we do, I think we've probably interacted more than ever with journalists. And mm-hmm. it's not something, again, one of those things in science you just never get trained to do. So how can we do that job better? Because, you know, we are part of that equation. And like you said, journalists are not the experts, but they're coming to people who are. So how, how can, mm-hmm. what can we do to help? Yeah, so I'm really glad you asked that question because it's, it, that was my favorite part of the discussion to think about and to help, right? It was, you know, so what do we do with this, all this really great results we found? And I think that there were a few things that came to mind for me from the data. The first is there were several journalists who were really frustrated by jargon, inaccessible language, really confusing, like reporting of methods and, and lack of, you know, explicit statements around limitations. This came through, and I don't think it's just about preprints. I think this is in general. If you write like your abstract and your paper in this super highly disciplinary niche way that makes it completely inaccessible to anybody, let alone a journalist, you know, it's just way less likely to get covered. And if it is covered, it's way less likely to get covered well, because they may completely misunderstand what you're talking about. So I think at the very least, be very mindful of the language you're using in your abstract, be very clear in your methods and your limitation and sort of the implications section as well, because those are important for a journalist, right? Like, why does this matter? But just in general, the more clearly you can write, the better for everybody, including academics. Um, (laughs) And then the second piece is really about that, you know, the mini peer review that was going on with preprints um, in particular, but as as we mentioned before, like some form of this does often happen with peer reviewed articles as well, which, as you know, can also be highly flawed and, and have lots of problems. Peer review is not a perfect system at all, is that if a journalist reaches out to you, and especially if it's a preprint, realize you're doing a form of peer review in many cases, and that is how the journalist may be thinking about it. And that is essentially the function you may be playing. But in this case, your audience is not your peers, it's not other academics in your field. It's the people who may be affected directly by this research. So when you're thinking about things like, what's the significance of this finding? Don't think about it for your own field. And as much as you think about it for the people who may end up reading that news story, you're hearing that radio broadcast, you know, what's in it for them? How could it affect their lives? And what are the risks if this ends up not holding up or if other studies down the road end up sort of disconfirming this evidence? You know, so really thinking about the interests of the public in maybe a similar way that the journalists in our study were thinking about the interests of the public and be responsive, like at least answer that journalist's question. If you don't have time, maybe recommend a peer who has that expertise to do it. You know, this is, as I think some other scholars have written about the COVID pandemic and and the science communication around it, like the quality of science communication is all of our responsibility, not just journalists. And it's so easy to critique journalists for all the ways that they have failed without ever looking at the work or the lack of work that scientists are doing themselves. And so I think for me, that is a major takeaway of this paper is, you know, think about your role, even if it's not your paper, even if it's it's your colleague's paper, of, of helping to ensure that journalism is doing a great job of covering new science in the most responsible way possible. And do so quickly, because they are on very tight yes, deadlines. they're on a deadline, yeah. <laughs> I've, I've had some contact me where they need an answer by like the next day. Or end of day. And I do, I mean, it's not something I've expected to do and it's something I quite enjoy doing. Um, but whenever a journalist gets in touch, I do, I prioritise that over peer review, to be honest, because I think it's a much more rewarding and it's more important than peer reviewers, in my opinion. Um, and so I, I, I always give more attention to the journalists. And if they, you know, if they don't mention me an article, so what? It stings a little bit, not going to lie. Would be yeah. nice. <laughs> but, you know, you've you've helped. And I, certainly in the some of the cases, I had one recently where I got an email from the, journalist saying that you know apologizing for not including me but that Mm -hmm. you know she was very thankful for the time and and the effort and it did help and so we don't always need outright attention and credit it's nice to just to be nice but it is unfortunate because you know academia is so based on credit and 
you know, demonstrating impact and demonstrating that you have done something valuable. And if we don't have metrics for something, it is instantly less valuable. And so if your name isn't in that news story, it is instantly less valuable and media coverage is already not seen as that valuable. And so it's, you know, you're really, it's almost like peer review in the sense you were kind of aware it's maybe a public, it's a duty as an academic to do peer review, but not really being rewarded for it in any measurable way. I feel like doing this, yeah, if we're going to call it truncated peer review for media coverage is even worse because it's, you may not even get to see your name in the news. You're just doing it to be a good human and a good scientist and a good member of society. And maybe that will change one day. But for now, I guess we're just relying on goodwill and nice humans for better or for worse. We could always do with more nice humans in the world. Yeah. Where do I find out about the different bioarchived licenses? This CC, BY, CDXY nonsense is driving me nuts. Hey, that bio have a resource for that? Ugh, that's your answer to everything. That's because they have everything you need to know about preprints. Sure, they probably have the basics, like info on the preprint servers, but what else is there? There's so much more. Looking to post a preprint, but not sure what different journal policies are? They have a collection to help you out with that. There are meetings around preprints and associated services. If you want to know how preprint adoption has changed over time, there's even a page on that. And COVID? They have a big section on preprints and the pandemic, plus some really cool infographics for communicating preprints. And university policies? Sure, they don't have that. They collect uni policies where possible. Okay, okay, they do sound pretty impressive, but is it not a bit of an echo chamber? It can be, but ASAP Bio also engage with people who don't love preprints and have concerns. So we had an excellent discussion on this very topic a couple of months ago. Oh, is there anything ASAP Bio don't do? Honestly, no, they're so nice over there. They were so quick to jump in and support this show. It's your one-stop shop for info on preprints and open science initiatives. So head over to asapbio.org to learn more and subscribe to their newsletter for the latest in preprint news. If you want a deeper dive into the world of preprints, then look out for the next recruitment of ASAP Bio Fellows. You've had a really interesting route into academia because you came from, I mean, my route, very straightforward. I undergrad, master's, PhD, lab, all lab-based, not necessarily the best route in, I don't think. But yours is quite different. So could you just give a quick overview of sort of your background before you ended your PhD? Sure. Yeah. So I was a researcher and then I was a communicator. And now I am both a communicator and a researcher who studies research communication, which is very, very meta. Um, (laughs) Amazing. <laughs> it's, I mean, yeah, uh, like many people in sort of the science communication space, a lot of folks come from many, like sort of a circuitous and not totally logical path that ends up magically making sense when you get here. And uh, that is definitely true for me as well. I started uh, with an undergrad in psychology, actually started in science and had a terrible time being a woman in science and left after one year and transitioned to a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology. And I loved it. We were doing really interesting research around, you know, like how people spend their money and how that makes them feel, you know, really publicly relevant research. But after some time, I got burnt out like many academics and also disillusioned because I felt like we were doing so much hard work and it wasn't really going anywhere. And, you know, maybe some of that was also my undergrad perspective. Like, I don't know what my PI was doing to to promote our work more broadly. You know, as the undergrad, you're not answering the media requests, right? But anyway, for all of those reasons, I left and returned to the only other thing I felt I knew how to do, which was writing. Um, So I spend a lot of time freelance writing, um, a lot for a local arts and culture magazine, actually, called Sad Magazine. And I loved it, but I was always sneaking in these interviews with experts. Like I would find any reason. I wrote a bit, I wrote a piece about cat videos on YouTube and I managed to interview three different researchers for this piece. <laughs> so I was doing like stealth science journalism for, for this mag. Um, and all of this led me to do a master's in publishing here at Simon Fraser University, which was a great experience. Got an awesome job being a book publicist for um, a local publisher called Greystone that actually does a lot of health and science books. And so it was like this research world just kept coming back into contact, no matter how far I tried to go into the real world of of non-academic jobs. And so I was pitching a bunch of these health and science books and health and science researchers who were authors 
to journalists and working with journalists closely, many of whom were health and science journalists. And after a couple of years, I realized I needed another quarter life crisis. <laughs> and so I <laughs> convinced my, my PI or my supervisor here to take me on as a student. And I've been doing um, a degree focusing on science communication ever since. I mean, obviously that you've got a really good insight from all sides of that because it's what you were doing. It's what you're now researching. And it is very, very meta. I love meta things. Meta things are great. We should all do meta research. Um, <laughs> but, you know, one of the things we get told often, particularly in the biosciences, is that you always need to th- step back and think about the bigger picture and how it impacts society and stuff. But you you came in with that mindset, I guess, with or certainly with that awareness. So how do you think that has impacted your experience as a PhD student? Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. I don't know even what my work would look like if I didn't have this experience. And the thing that's nice about qualitative research, like what the the paper we just did and that we talked about in the show today, is like you get to say explicitly, this is where I come from and this has shaped the way that I interpret this data, which is so different from sort of hard science research or sort of more quantitative analysis, even though, of course, you know, your background is still going to inform how you interpret that data and make sense of it. So that's been really nice with this more recent work is, is being allowed to lean really heavily on, on, on your outside perspectives. And, you know, I think that the lens of thinking about how research is used is so helpful. And thinking about what are the realities of a journalist is also so helpful because these are sort of the people most affected by the research that I've been doing in my PhD. And then even now as a PhD student, I have a lot of conversations with journalists, you know, about my own work, about other people's work when, when I get asked to comment on it. And I always use those opportunities to learn something about what are their needs, what's going on for them, what do they think about this research? And all of those questions have deeply shaped the way that I approach my next paper. And the ideas that come to mind and even the way that I interpret things that I read in the literature, uh, because there's almost like these two lenses. And um, yeah, there's a really interesting, actually, indigenous framework. It's called two-eyed seeing, where you have one eye that looks from traditionally sort of the Western perspective and the other eye is looking from that indigenous knowledge perspective. And I feel like, you know, you can do something similar by looking from this practice perspective and this whatever we want to call it research perspective or theory perspective. And the idea is, you know, you don't need to integrate these two ways of seeing. You can let each one stand on its own and, you know, you can appreciate the integrity of that way of seeing fully. But then at some point you take these two perspectives and you use them to get a more comprehensive idea of what is going on. That's also why interdisciplinary research is so nice, right? Everybody's bringing their own lens. (laughs) So I guess one question I should ask, broad, unsolicited career advice for everyone. What advice would you have for anyone who wants to do some freelance writing? Because one of the things Twitter would have us all believing is that there's been a max exodus from academia. I I manage community postdocs, and one of the things that comes off often there is a sort of desire for non-academic things and events and getting out of academia. So, you know, freelancing is one of those things you can do on the side or on those things you can use to transition out. So have you got any advice for people who want to do maybe freelance writing? Yeah, good question. So the thing that is tricky about this advice is there's the equity question and this thing of being paid for your labor. Because the easiest and most effective way to start freelancing is to volunteer. And so not everybody is in a position where they can volunteer. So that's this is the challenge of this advice. I definitely got most of my experience early on as a volunteer writer. So writing for my student paper, becoming a volunteer magazine editor for, I think it was a year and a half. You learn to write by doing and getting feedback from mentors. And you also get jobs in writing by being able to demonstrate a track record. So if you have the capacity to volunteer or start your own blog uh, for, you know, which is also volunteer work, that is just going to be so much more helpful because you can share what you've written and demonstrate that you kind of know what you are doing. That said, yeah, it's a huge equity issue. It's like the unpaid intern question, right? Mm -hmm. And writing jobs are often, like I've seen some writing jobs advertised that it's just criminal, like these listicle type articles, I saw, you know, the 10 ways to uh, improve your health. I saw a job posting that was $1 a bullet point. So $1 for each of those, you know, like that you just shouldn't pay then. You should just call this volunteer work, you know. I mean, at least you can do the math really easily on that one though, for how much you're going to get paid at least. 
Yeah. So, you know, that's, it's so tricky, but there are lots of programs coming out now that are, you know, specifically funding, you know, equity seeking groups who want to get into writing and they want to get into science writing. So um, that's a really nice way because you can actually get paid to do that learning and that experience building. So whether you're finding uh, like a paid opportunity or you're finding like doing this in your own time as a volunteer, the advice still stays like the same, you know, find a way to write publicly and get feedback on it and then improve over time and practice. And that is just, I just think it's the only way like take some writing courses, get some input, but you have to do it or you will never really learn it. You'll never really get better. I mean, that's our approach to this podcast. Let's do it. Let's do it. See how it goes. It sounds professional. I think we're getting better. <laughs> we're, um, the original introduction I did was terrible. Now I sound slightly happy that I'm talking to people. Um, so we're getting there. <laughs> um, so you've already alluded to this. And you know, one of the things, I mean, we've been doing this podcast for like eight months now, maybe something mm-hmm. like that, less than a year. And it, it's definitely been probably the highlight of my every two weeks or every week, depending on how often we do. Because I think it's just, it's so nice just to take a step back and talk broadly about somebody else's research that usually I don't know anything about. I've learned a lot, forgotten a lot, sorry, Google. Um, but I've learned a lot temporarily um, about things that I would never have come across. And I just love talking to people about what they do. It's much better than being stuck in the lab where, I mean, I work on my own in the lab unless my boss is helping me. So it's a lonely day. So I think SciComm should be a fundamental part of every scientist's job. What are your thoughts on that? Well, so I also believe everybody should be able to communicate about science and should be making it available to people. The problem is academics have so many other things they also have to do. And so this is the real tension. Like if you want to value science communication, we have to also ease some of the other things that we are asking people to do because you will lose every academic if if we're also. So I don't have a solution. I think, you know, our lab has done a lot around, you know, review and promotion and tenure guidelines and how these public facing Um, aspects of faculty work are undervalued and sort of not as explicitly valued in these guidelines. And so maybe that is an area of shift that we could see that change happening is, is the science communication going to be a part of what gets you a promotion, what gets you a tenured position in academia? And if so, we're probably going to have to ease up on some of that journal impact factor stuff that is really not that helpful anyway. But why it's valuable is exactly what you're saying. You know, first of all, it means that when you get to a dinner party and your mom uh, asks you to tell your aunt, what are you studying again? You actually have a somewhat cohesive answer and people can understand. The other thing is, yeah, getting feedback from people like journalists who have a really different perspective, but also allowing a wider community of people to access, understand, and use science, which, you know, we've seen during this pandemic is really, really important for lots of different reasons, but it doesn't have to be a crisis for science to matter. Um, I'm always surprised, you know, when, when I have covered very obscure research areas in in news stories and in magazine articles you see a very wide community of people engaging with it Um, like there's some tools you can use to monitor social media conversations and i have looked at where some of my news stories have gone and it's quite fascinating there was also like our lab did i managed the blog for our lab or at least i have for the last couple years and we did a blog post about you know a tiny little bit of a research chapter that somebody was putting out that stephanie hausstein who's one of the co-directors here put out and we just did a whole blog post about emojis in tweets about academic research and you know this is like a two lines in the actual chapter, but we fleshed it out and we had some jokes and I think I had a poop emoji in the headline. And this got shared in the most, you know, outrageous spaces. It made it into the London School of Economics scholarly impact blog. Uh, It got cited in the conversation, like it circulated everywhere on social media. And so you just never know. You just never know who the people are who might find your research interesting, valuable, useful. And you also never know in what ways they will. So making that research available in as many ways as possible and in an understandable and accessible format, it just opens the gates to so many more opportunities and for just a wider community of people to be involved in this sometimes insular and closed off reality of science. Yeah, some of the, well, some of the most thought-provoking conversations, I guess, that I've had have come from opinion pieces I've written 
and things like that way because people do read them and they actually do get back in touch with you and email you whereas yes. you can put a paper out and they'll read it but they won't actually talk to you about it unless you see them at a conference whereas the general public take a lot more of a direct approach which is yeah, it's nice. usually yeah. nice yeah so what does your future hold where what are your immediate plans are you planning to stay in academia and carry this kind of track on or do you want to run for the hills like everyone on twitter is good question um well i'm still doing my phd so i have to actually finish that or i want to finish it um i am hoping to do another paper around preprints and journalism so keep your eyes out for that and you know so far despite all the awful things of academia and all the running for the hills tweets you've been mentioning you know i love it here and i want to stay so I guess I will be on the job market looking for jobs, whatever horrors that entails uh, in about a year. And hopefully that will lead me to an academic job that I love in maybe some science journalism, science communication, health communication space. But everything is so uncertain, right? If the pandemic has taught us anything, it's you really can't predict what's going to happen in one year. Yeah. Okay. I think that's us done. I think, I think that's everything I've got. Emma, anything else to add? I mean, we usually ask about how you found the process of preprinting, but I don't know if that's a bit. Uh, so I haven't, I haven't asked this because Alice does a lot of preprints anyway. So. Well, I will say, I will say that okay. So our first paper that was about preprints and journalism, we didn't preprint it. You know, it was early in the pandemic. We actually just needed to get it out, and there was a special call for COVID papers, and so we just. It was sort of funny. It was like more time efficient to just do the journal publication in this case, and. So we did. And this time though, we didn't have this time crunch. We were, we were, you know, had time to think of and talk about it. And yeah, our lab really cares about preprints. Like I also value preprints. And I think that first study we did was kind of critical in a way of, of the way that journalists have been covering preprints. And so symbolically, it also felt important to preprint this one and you know, make it clear we believe preprints are a good thing. You know, we actually really value preprints and think they're worthwhile. And I don't think they need to be not covered by journalists. I just think journalists need to do a good job of covering them and scientists need to do a good job of supporting them in that in that work. Um, so yeah, even though we have preprinted many things before, it it felt particularly important to preprint it in this case. Um, and it's also been really nice because it meant we could share it with the journalists who we interviewed and get their feedback. We shared it on social media. We've gotten some really interesting comments also from other journalists there. Um, you know, it's been on, it's now on pre-lights. Thanks very much. And getting some, you know, we'll get some interesting feedback through that. And so all of these things are just going to make this paper so much better because we won't just have our two or three reviewers letting us know what they think. We'll hopefully have a wider community of people letting us know what, it, what they think. And hopefully that includes some preprints in motion listeners. Um, you can definitely reach out to me. We really like to hear from readers um, from any perspective. So yeah, thanks thanks for having me here. It's actually lovely to, to have this opportunity. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, thank you so much. I really enjoyed, um, well, reading the preprint and listening to you talk about it. I think it's a really important point about how we can, or we should try and value science communication more, or we shouldn't mm -hmm. value science communication more and be able to explain our research to everyone. It's mm -hmm. it's so important and how journalists use it and everything. <laughs> and you guys are doing it right here, right now. Right? <laughs> We're trying to. Doing our best. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. That was That was great. Okay, and that is the show. If you enjoyed listening, then hit that subscribe button for more and leave us a review on whatever platform it is you're listening on. You can reach out to us on Twitter at MotionPod or online at preprintsinmotion.com. Didn't enjoy that? Well, we're all scientists here, so send us your review and let us know what works or what you'd like to hear more of, or less of. But until next time, have a good week. <laughs>